too. And these days, it's super important to uh, get candidates interested in the uh, job opportunities because the IT job market is so saturated, right? And uh, a Java developer from Poland can work for any company, not just in Poland, but also in Western Europe or even in the United States. So also the HR managers um, have really challenging job these days. They need to make sure that the uh, vacancies and job opportunities stand out uh, in one way or the other. So what would be your suggestion on how they can make the vacancies and the job opportunities stand out? Well, starting with the million dollar question. I love it. Uh, so uh, first of all, I, I, from my observation, uh, it's definitely the case. As you know, I've been traveling over 35 countries, working in organizations globally, uh, helping companies to come together to, to, to boost their culture, their performance. And, um, and I often talk to HR people, right? That's my clients. Um, and uh, I remember recently I had a conversation with, uh, with one of my clients, an HR person, and she was sharing that she, she posted a job ad for a technical position. And after a few weeks, she got seven people, seven applications, right? Mm -hmm. What you're talking about, like the developers or tech talent is so wanted. They're so on demand. Salaries are crazy high, right? Compared to other industries. And and so there's so much power into, into the employees. So what do we do? to get them attracted to join our company as opposed to any other company out there, right? And sometimes you cannot compete on the paycheck, right? Because at some points you can, some companies can, but I don't know if you're a smaller company, a startup, or or you're not McKinsey or a big, large corporation, it, it could be really, really tough. I don't have the magic answer, the, the one secret that will change your recruitment experience but but the topic that i want to explore with you is the is the topic of culture and investing in your culture creating a culture that people want to join and be a part of genuinely right not just uh, you know using it as a recruitment tool yeah we have a great culture but but actually building a culture that that people want to be a part of so so that's the topic that uh, I'll be happy to explore more and maybe share some good examples if if that's uh, would be relevant for your audience. Yeah, that would be super cool. And uh with with culture obviously lots of companies start with the core values, right? They have a management brainstorm to figure out what the core values are, then they create a list of these values and the HR managers start including them on the job descriptions, but they may not really live and breathe those values, right? So uh, how do you go from this kind of management exercise to really like living those values and uh, presenting to candidates in some like real way? So, so first of all, that's what usually happens. It's a management exercise. But the most forward thinking companies make sure that they include people from all levels of the organization when they are crafting the values. When you're a small startup, it's much easier, right? You're 5, 10, 20 people. You can go to a team of site. You can have a bunch of exercises. You can talk about these things. Amazing. When you're a large organization, it could be a little bit more difficult. I'll give you an example. Uh, Chris Robbins, uh, he was a former CEO of Tele2, uh, Telco from Estonia. So he, he loves to do transformation with companies. When he joins a company as a leader, the first he, things he does is, I want to make sure we're on the same page when it comes to values. So he would go to the company and he would talk to people and say, hey guys, who are the, in the case with Tele2, who are Tele2 kind of people? Who, who are people who really incorporate our values? Martin, Maria, Peter, okay, cool. He brings these people from all levels of the organization and he pushes them to go to a team of site themselves, right? It could be the cleaner. It could be the receptionist. It could be the manager, right? He gets them together, and now they have to talk about who are we really? What is our DNA? What do we stand for? Values are not just something you put on the job at. This is a decision-making tool. These are our principles. This is what we believe in as an organization, right? So once you craft them, it's not just, all right, done. Now you can put it on the job ad. No, you got to live it on a daily basis. It has to be a buy-in from the leadership and then all levels down on the organization 
but first the leadership, right? If, if one of your values is we're always punctual and then the C-level executive manager, whatever, is late for a meeting twice this week and there's no consequences, then that's not a value that we live. This is a BS that we put on the webpage, right? So, so the first step, whatever way you want to do it, is to come together, if you can include and involve as many of the people as you can as part of this experience to, to craft initially your values. And that could be a process. Um, often it could take, I don't know, one, two, three years to really get them, nail them, not just what are the values, but how do we language them so they mean something to us? And and I would say, because I've been crafting the values in my team for, for a couple of years, and, and finally we nailed them, you know, six values. But but then at some point, more people started joining the team. And in my mind, it was like, yeah, man, one of the values is productivity and ownership. Clear, right? It wasn't clear. So you have to come down and really bow them down. What are the behaviors within our culture, within our company, that when we do them, we're living the values, right? Like specifically, what are the exact, you know, as mm -hmm. bullet points? And you have everybody to contribute to that discussion. And we agree upon that. This is who we are. Now, when you're hiring somebody, of course, you're going to add it to, to your job ad. When you have an interview, you will talk about it. You lead people through. And this should be a commit, commitment of the leadership, commitment of the HR. Hey, we're only bringing people on board who are feeding our culture and who can live our values. Very, very difficult. Very difficult mm -hmm. when, you, when you have a scarcity of talent when it comes to IT tech talent. Super difficult, right? You have to make compromises. But can you actually afford to make a compromise? Because when you do, right, and you hire the negative Joe who is a good developer, can you actually... Mm -hmm control how they're going to impact the rest of the people that they collaborate with yeah, yeah. so well that's that's really a tough one <clears throat> especially because of the uh, talent shortage on the it job market i mean you can have a great developer finally someone applies uh, and the guy may not be really i don't know punctual right and if the core value is to be punctual then uh, what do you do right do you reject well that's usually the the hard choice um yeah but that's i guess what um separates the really great companies that put the core values you know on the on the top of the priorities list um yeah so um just just uh, thinking further like what um, what are some ways on how the hr managers can include these values on the job descriptions like do you recall any like interesting examples that you could uh, walk us through um let me think about it I'm not sure I have some extremely good examples, but uh, like like on top of my head, but I remember a company that's doing it really well and maybe people who are listening can go check out uh, the remotecompany.com. Uh, the company that uh, built products like MailerLite um, and their co-founder Ilma Tiki recently actually published a book talking about how they build a culture uh, and think, think about their, their remote company for, you know, for 10 years plus before Corona and everything. Uh, so they not only put the values as part of the job statement, but as I recall, they, they ask you as part of your assignment to, to do something. For example, you know, MailerLite is a competitor of MailChimp. Right, so mm -hmm. so they're doing these newsletters, emails, and so on. So the person who is applying, they need to, for example, do a newsletter, like using the platform. Mm -hmm. But when they do the newsletter, you can observe, right? Like the HR person can actually see how they're acting, how like how how they're writing the copy, what are they doing, right? So I think without having a really good example to share, it's it's. The HR person, the recruiter, has to have it as one of their checklists, you know, that because they usually have a checklist with uh, do they cover the skills, are they motivated, right? One of the checklists should be, are these people believing in the same things? Do I see any red flags culturally, mm -hmm. right? The same person, Ilma, um, 
she shared with me this story, which I think is a very good example. So because they work remotely, initially they decided we're going to meet every year for one or two months. We rent a house in a nice place like Bali. We come together, we live together, we um, we work together, right? Mm -hmm. Workation. Um, and they get to know each other. And then the first time they did it, she, she figured out, I don't want some people from the team to be around my kids. Oh, wait a second. Why did we hire these people? Mm -hmm. Oh, because we can afford them and they were really good. Yeah, but if I don't want them to be around my kids because they have a negative impact on my kids because of their personal traits and mm -hmm. values, what do we have to do? So they had some discussions and, and they, they had to let go of these people. And that was the moment that they decided we're not doing that. And, you know, maybe an easier way, because, again, we're talking about shortage of talent. An easier way is to think about what are the never-tolerate kind of values? What are the, what are the anti-values, right? Like, what are the mm -hmm. things that if somebody has these behaviors, it's toxic and we, will, we can't keep them. We can't actually hire them. It could be difficult to, to, to spot people because everybody is trying to present themselves with the best possible energy, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, when you make it a commitment and when leaders of the organization, once again, I'm coming back to it, are living the values of the organization, they're the living example of the values. When somebody breaches the values, there is consequence, right? Sometimes we don't want to talk to the people in the company that the peak performance and they might be, I don't know, negative or they are late or they spread negative energy. I don't know. But we don't want to do anything about their behavior because hey, they're doing their job. They're performing. But that's, that's rotting the culture. Yeah. And, and culture, is what, culture is what we attract a lot of people, right? We're talking about values and, and purpose. Like, why do you exist in the first place? Values is on one side, but the, the, the mission. Why are we here? You know, pe people want to join companies that has purpose. And everybody's listening to Simon Sinek and read the book, Start mm -hmm. With Why. And it's more of a cliche now, but but it's just it just works. It's practical. When you believe in something and you get people who believe in the same thing, right? If Maybe it's the technology, man. It's the impact that uh, the technology is bringing to the world, right? But But then people are excited. They're engaged. They want to do stuff. I, I was uh, talking this morning, uh, you know, recording this uh, session for a conference on employee engagement. And we, I shared with you prior to the podcast, um, mentioning an example with a company from Germany called uh, Plan A for the Planet. So they are in the business of combating climate change and raising awareness around climate change. Well, in other words, supporting companies to decrease their you know negative emissions to the environment and, and all these kind of things right but i had a conversation with the ceo and the founder of the company lubumio Erdanova, kikas female founder and i asked her how do you grow so fast she said well, what do you mean i mean when you have to hire so many new people how do you find these people right and a lot of technical people and she said we don't have to okay what do you mean? Well, and by the way, there were 100 people last year. I just read a couple of days ago, they raised 24, 27 million round. And now they're more than 240 people, maybe hiring more. Okay. Wow. It's like, how, how do you get so many top level people? And she said, we don't have to. Because we have a waiting list of people who want to be part of what we do. The mission right? That's what we do. That's, you know, we're changing the world in our way. We are making an impact positively. People want to be part of that, especially the younger generation now, right? They want to be working for something that has meaning, that has purpose. And coming back on the culture and values, it's not just some fancy words. It's how do we operate? Literally, how do we operate? How, how nice and positive is the vibe? How are people treating me, right? Part of the culture is do I know what are my priorities? Is, is my management and leadership clear enough to tell me these are the top three things that you got to do? Do I have the freedom? A lot of the younger people, take, take talent. 
they want to have flexibility, right? Some people wake up and start working at 11. Hmm. And, and But that's fine as long as they get things done, right? Do you create this structure in your organization where people can feel, I can be myself. I have the support of the HR and the management. And because when you start building that and you invest resources in that, people talk. Developers know how to developers, right? People mm -hmm. talk and, and they're like, man, you got to come and work for us, you know, because this is such a cool place. People treat you well. You know, you can get breaks if you're feeling tired. You can, you can, you inv people invest in you. Learning is a big thing, by the way. I had a conversation with the first uh, uh, chief HR of LinkedIn. He was hired when the company, uh, you can check it out. My podcast is called Productivity Mastery. His name is Steve Carrigan. He was hired when there was a, you know, LinkedIn was a growing company, but 400 people. Hmm. And then they grew the, they grew the company to 4,000 people in three and a half years. I can imagine the craziness, right? Crazy. How do you compete? How do you compete with, with the mastodons of the tech world of like Google's and, and, and I don't know if it was meta back in the time, in the day, no idea, hmm. but the, you know, how do you compete with the, with Microsoft, right? when they can pay much bigger salaries, right? And, and one of the things he, he, he shared, a few things he shared, but he shared one of them is you give them ownership. He said, hey, you can make decisions. You can actually have a major part in the code. You can, you can take ownership, right? We will be there for you. We invest in your learning and growth. This is a big one, learning and growth. If you don't incorporate learning in your job description, in your employee experience right sit down with the person and say look part of your benefits part of your perks we're going to invest in you like what are the skills that you want to learn the, the hard skills what are the people skills and management skills you want to learn we're going to invest in coaching we're going to invest in courses we're going to invest in these kind of sessions that we do we will do a lot of team of size like people love to learn right I mean, simple, simple example from, from my, my small company, right? I, I'm, I'm a consultant. I, I'm, the, I'm the company, right? Like I'm delivering workshops, speeches globally. Um, I have a team of several people who believe in my mission. It's our mission, right? They're part of it. Like it's, it's not my company, but I'm the face, right? So we work remotely. Now, personal development and learning is one of our core values. And, and one of the practices we came up with, which been super successful, we call it personal development hour. So every week we spend an hour, hour and a half. One person from the team is leading a session connected to personal development. Like nothing connected to work. Could be this, this week uh, somebody did a session on uh, emotional intelligence. We did a test together. We had a discussion. Last week we spoke about... Uh, habits and how do you build habits so we created this spreadsheet and everybody's putting their habits there we're tracking them daily we have this accountability thing mm -hmm. three weeks ago i did a session on time management we talk about time management how can we improve that like personally so i don't know what practices will work for you another company i coached recently a startup from from italy because they they have developers in different places uh, and it's 10 15 people company um they they do this practice called green coffee practice. I don't know why they call it green coffee, but basically mm -hmm. every week you are put together and you have to have a virtual coffee mm -hmm. for 15, 20 minutes with one person of the company. It's part of your job, you know, like, hey, you and Michael set up a call and have coffee, right? It's company time. You pay for like personal development hour. It's company time. I, I pay people to join, right? What can you do in your company so you can invest in your people, in their development, in their growth? And again, it's a commitment from the management as well. Sometimes it's not, it's not bringing an external. Sometimes it's about part of the, the time that the manager needs to spend is, is not only operational, right, but the leadership side. Maybe sometimes you need to spend 45 minutes to talk to your employee, Michael, because Michael is not feeling well. And that's, that's not in the job description, right? It's like, hey, Michael, how's it going? Let's, let's spend an hour. Let's talk about it. I see you're 
struggling at the moment, right? I mean, simple stuff. Everybody knows it, man. Mm -hmm. Feedback. People crave feedback. People, people love feedback. We're afraid to give people feedback. They love it. Positive feedback, but actually there's a lot of studies that show that people love constructive feedback. If you're only giving them the positive, they think something is wrong. They, they think it's you're hiding mm -hmm. something. You, you, you have to create a culture that feedback is allowed. Because mm -hmm. when you do that, people will start opening up and actually give you feedback as well. People are afraid to give feedback especially in Eastern Central Europe, because mm. we have this hierarchy, right? Yeah. yeah. It's like, ah, I don't, I'm not going to tell my manager that he, he was really bad at that meeting. No, 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 no. I, keep it quiet, man. I just do my job. That's not how you create a culture that people want to join, right? So all this simple stuff, man, mm. clarity of expectations. You know, when somebody's coming, look, this is the, the job position that you're applying for. Let me tell you, it might change a little bit. We might throw you into different projects. How do you like to work? Let's personalize your experience. Everybody's different. You know, I don't know how many people I talked to that that told me the same thing. Like I literally had like seven different podcasts, gets one after another. Everybody said the same thing. Leadership is personalized. I spoke to Chris Williams, who was a former vice president of, uh, of HR of uh, Microsoft. He worked directly with Bill Gates. And he repeated it three or four times. Leadership should be individualized. Right? Every person is different. We like to say it's a team sport. He said that. We like to say it's a team sport. Is it a team sport? It's, it is a team sport, maybe. But, but you have to approach every person that you manage individually because people have different needs, different motivations. And, and it has to be a commitment of the company to, to care for people, you know, creating development plans, but not just top down. Hey, we want to grow you as a manager. And uh, in three months, okay, dude, you didn't ask me. You know, the thing is, look, man, I, I have so much insights because my job is I'm, I'm the guy they, they bring on board to help companies solve problems from the people side, okay? So, so I work a lot with managers, but I also often get hired to talk to employees and they share with me <laughs> their problems. And it's the same stuff. It's the same stuff. I'm not given feedback enough. Um, it's very hard and I'm overwhelmed because I have very different priorities and my manager is messy. Uh, I'm not doing what I love to do. People don't ask me what I love to do. They just throw me projects because they need to get done. How about you have these discussions? You know, when you're splitting roles and responsibilities, you're not really focused only on what people are really good at, but you have a discussion and say, hey, what, what motivates you? Hmm. What do you love to do? You know, look, for the next three months, you still have to do this because we need to finish this project, but I'm committing that I will find projects that you can do 30, 40% of the time focused on the things that you want to develop and grow into. I mean, imagine having a company that majority of the time that people spend is focused on the things that people are not just good at, they love to do it. They're excited and passionate. They can't wait in the morning to wake up and just, hey, man, let's move. I mean, simple stuff, man. Mm -hmm. it's, it's simple stuff, but the problem is we don't do it consistently. Yeah, It's mm -hmm. co common, common knowledge is not common practice right like <laughs> everybody knows what should be done everybody knows that are you yeah. committed and it's a long term that is the problem you're not going to get the results tomorrow you know you, you you're so busy hr people are so busy like i mean honestly people don't realize how busy hr people how, how much work how much demands is on them, how many expectations i mean everybody who's listening is an hr you know people department I mean, seriously, guys, you're doing an incredible job. So much work you're doing. Like recruitment, uh, processing, legal, contracts. All, I mean, all the, it's crazy. Okay? So it's difficult, but can you make it a commitment? Can you make it a commitment that investing in our people is important? Investing in our culture is important. Making small steps. You know, start small. 
choose one practice, involve the people. You know, I, I was talking to uh, another great guest on my podcast, John Rennie, who's a former nuclear submariner, meaning <laughs> he wasn't a nuclear submarine, uh, American one during the Cold War. Oh, wow. And then now he's teaching leadership. But 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 after after his five years in the Navy, he I don't know if it's called Navy, the submarine stuff, but uh he he he's been a manager in, in many different in the industries, including production industry. So um he'll be a manager on the production, and I mean maybe some of you who are listening are managing on production, and he came up with this with this uh, strategy because he realized I, I don't I don't really know what are the challenges of the people that are on the production line. You know, if I go and talk to them, it doesn't really, I don't really get it. So he decided he committed every Friday and he calls it uh, Fridays on the floor. Every Friday from 8 to 12, I'm going to go and work on the production floor with the employees. I don't care if I'm manager, let me put my ego aside and I'm, I work, you know, with them. And he will change the different roles every week but he will be down there he's like you can't imagine how how many things i learned what are their problems what are their challenges what are they struggling with and you you gain the trust of people right because you're there with them like mm -hmm. a little bit after there have been all the management who buy into this strategy right so so they'll do this on the friday i mean there's there's many strategies there's many different things you can do there's a company um with a Bulgarian co-founder, it was called uh, Limplum. Uh, they got sold, I think, to Clever Top uh, a couple of years ago. But when they were building the company as part of the, you know, designing and crafting the culture, was they believed in, and I think it was called Big Talk Lunches. So, so um, they pick five, ten people from the team from different departments, right, and they buy them lunch and they give them uh, like a ball with questions you can pick from. So you pick a question and the question could be something like, uh, uh, what is your first memory of success? Or um, who was a mentor or, or a teacher that you really admired and why? So they put them together, people from different departments and we just talk, you know, mm -hmm. and the, the co-founder, I listened to an interview with him. He He said, one of the, one of the secrets of success in an organization and a team is you make people like each other. You build this trust by making people like each other. They don't have to be friends, but they have to like each other. What do you do in your company to make people like each other? I, I spoke to the, the uh, cinematographer, director of photography, Shane Herbert, again, you can check it out on Productivity Master in my podcast. Shane Herbert is the episode. Um, we talk about leadership. He, he was a guy who shot Terminator Salvation. Uh, he shot uh, Need for Speed, major blockbusters, right? One of the top Hollywood uh, cinematographers. And, and ask him about leadership and, and what, uh, what are his challenges as a leader, right? And just to give you an idea, on Terminator Salvation with Christian Bell, he had to lead 250 people just in the camera department you know lighting people cable you name it grip all the all the different people it's a lot of people you know and it's very wow. very tense environment very short deadlines so so ask him what are your leadership challenges and he said my biggest leadership challenge is to make sure every person from my team is making the same movie let that sink for a moment in your organization, is every person from the team making the same movie? Is everybody on the same page? Is marketing and sales and operations and, and tech on the same page and, and making the same movie, working towards the same vision? By the way, we spent 20 minutes, 20 minutes with uh, Chris Williams, the, the former vice president of HR of Microsoft, talking about vision. He was given the task for, for six months he was given the task to figure out what makes a project successful. He went and spent six months just going through all the different projects and, and all the ones that failed, all the ones that succeeded. And he said at the end, it was one common factor. 
the projects that win had a very clear vision. Everybody knew where we are going. It was very clear and concise what we are after. How many times we don't give any perspective for our employees where we are going, right? Clarity. And then you build it backwards. This is the vision. All right. These are the goals for the next three months, the most important goals. Let's talk about your individual priorities on the team. Where should your time go? What are your individual priorities on the project? This and this. Okay. What percentage of your time and energy should go into these priorities? 60%, 80%. I don't know. Okay. We're on the same page. Let's go. Let's move. These kind of things, man. It's it's not rocket science, but it's a commitment. Well, you, you uncovered so many very interesting areas. And I don't even know which one to follow up on first because there were just so many different aspects that you uh, dived deeper to. Um, and it just kind of triggered lots of ideas also in my mind on what we should do better in, in our company. So it's just like I'm taking notes as we as we speak or as you speak. Just, um, just, to, one, just to give here one very simple thing, because as you said, maybe you're like, where do I start? Um, I want to give you a tool. So our methodology, the perform methodology, is exactly done for that. Right? So, so there are seven areas. Purpose and value. P stands for purpose and values. Right? Perform is the acronym. Purpose and values. Second area, effective planning. Third area, roles and responsibilities. F for focus and execution. O for optimal energy. R for robust communication. And M for mental toughness. Now, what I want you to do, Michal, is sit together with your team, block an hour, hour and a half, and ask everybody, explain them what each of these areas means in a team context, and then ask them to vote and rate it. And say, hey guys, being completely honest, from one to 10, what grade would you give us as a team in each of these seven areas? Okay? Purpose and values. I don't know. Somebody says four. Somebody says seven. Somebody says nine. Okay? They do it anonymously first because you don't want to bias them. And then you sit and you have a real talk. All right, Michal, why did you put a nine on effective planning? Maria has a four. What do you mean by nine? Well, I think we're very clear. This is, okay, Maria, why do you think it's a nine? It's a four, sorry. Well, I I never know what the plans are. Maybe you guys on the executive level understand it. I have no idea. Interesting. What do you think you should do or we should do so we can go to a higher level? You can rate it higher. And you have a real meaningful discussion. We've done that with more than 500 teams across Europe and, and globally, mainly across Europe. Startups, banks, you know, corporates, doesn't matter. You, you uncover where the gaps are and you talk about what are the specific things that you can do currently at this stage with the resources that you have. And what is the one area? Because you can't solve it all at once. What is the one area we should focus on just now? Maybe it's planning. Okay, we need to be more clear. All right, let's commit to a half a day strategy session. Amazing. Let's do that. Maybe it's execution. We are all around the place. Cool. What do we have to say no to? Let's have a look at the older projects and let's say no to things or postpone and delegate. I don't know. Optimal energy. We've been so overwhelmed. Okay, what can we do to improve the well-being? There's a company in Bulgaria. This is a little bit of an extreme example. It's called Fast Track. I listened to a podcast with the, with the founder, CEO. So they believe people who exercise perform better. And it's also good for them. So so. If you work for the company, it's mandatory for you to spend one hour in the gym, company time. If you don't wow. go to the gym once, you get, you get a warning. If you don't go twice, you get a warning. Third time, you're fired. They have wow. a gym in the office. They have a shower. So one of the eight hours you work, you, you have to exercise. So every day? Every day. Five days a week. Wow. wow. Now, now, I'm not saying that's, that, that's something that that's every extreme. person that's listening needs to... Yeah. It needs to take to heart. This is an extreme example, but but it's also an example. You know who you are. When you define your values and culture, this is what companies are struggling with. They try to be politically correct. Transparency, integrity, 
honesty. And then, then you talk to the employees, it's like, nobody's honest, nobody's transparent. It's like, no, don't be politically correct. Who are you really? Okay, 90% of people probably not going to want to work for this company or, or 80 or, or 60. But this 10, 20%, man, they'll be committed, you know? You find your tribe. And then, again, <laughs> we're coming back to the shortage of talent, right? It's really mm-hmm. difficult. But, but long term, the more you do that, the more you're going to attract more of these people, right? Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, perform, man. Perform. You can find it online. You just, just get the freaking thing. You go to my webpage, stoyanyankov.com. I think you can find and download the exercise for free. Um, just sit down, have this discussion. And based on that, okay, maybe it's the planning that we need to focus on. Maybe it's the culture side. I don't know. What can we do? Then you start researching. You get people on board to contribute with ideas. You commit and you implement. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Well, this, this is super important, especially, you know, in regards to the knowledge versus practice, right? We all, you know, listening to this podcast, we may have the knowledge, you know, but then when it comes to executing <clears throat> these things, we're like, oh, well, you know, we have some more urgent things to do and uh, let's serve these clients. And then you kind of procrastinate. So the, the practice itself is important. And um, you know, what's, you know what's one of the, the most common phrases I get when I do a management workshop on time management? Mm-hmm. One person from the room will come to me and say, Stoyan, I love your workshop. I, I, these tools are amazing. Very practical, very good. But I don't have time to plan my time. Mm-hmm. You don't get it. I, I'm, we, we're so busy. I'm so overwhelmed. I don't have time to plan my time. <laughs> and I'm mm-hmm. always like smiling. I'm like, when was the last time you planned your time? Because maybe maybe the fact that you haven't planned your time is the reason you have no time. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> this is this is common thing, man. Everybody knows I need to have a to-do list. And this to-do list should be smart, should come, you know, what are the long-term goals? What are the priorities? And then based on that, you prioritize the things that matter more you don't just make a list of of uh, you know 30 unrelated items like budget email mm. leads like okay that's not concrete man right follow up with leads okay hello lead i just wanted to follow up check you know oh <laughs> task done no you don't want to follow up with the lead right Productivity is all about being clear. What is the end result? Right? In anything you do, if you're recruiting talent, what is your end result? You always start with the end in mind. And then you build it backwards. Mm. You know, do sales. That's not an end result. I can spend 18 hours doing sales and maybe call to people. How about you're more measurable? What are the activities that will generate highest impact per time unit? Okay. What is the end result we are after? And maybe your end result is to, to get a key cast developer with this uh, seniority level and this salary from Slovakia. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's your end result. Let's build it backwards. Let's brainstorm all the different activities that you can use to get there. Right? Maybe there are 17 different things that you do. You do Facebook ads and you do referral program. And I don't know. There's a book called The One Thing, written by Gary Keller and uh, Jay Papason. Again, another great person who I had on the podcast, Jay Papason, a podcast called Productivity Master, if you guys want to check it. The One Thing, these guys are, these guys are hardcore business people. Okay. So they they built uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, real estate company in the world, more than quarter million employees. But they also write books about their business philosophy. The whole book, the whole their business philosophy is, is based around the concept of the one thing. And maybe for recruiters listening, that could be the most valuable thing for from the whole conversation. When you are posting a new ad, 
you have all the different strategies and ideas of how you can attract more applicants, top level applicants. Okay. The question you want to ask yourself in this case or in general is what's the one thing you can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or necessary? What's the one strategy with the highest effectiveness? Okay. Maybe that's uh, asking my employees for referrals. I don't know. But based on your experience and data, what's the one strategy? And can you actually double down on this strategy? Instead of doing 17 different things and having no space to really focus on any of them. Hmm. I don't know. Just thinking. I mean, think about it in anything in your life, man. If you can apply this thinking Mm. on a daily basis, what's the one thing I should do today that will have the highest impact on my life and my business? That's a good one. That's a good one indeed. Well, I'll start using it right away. I'll check this uh, (laughs) book on Kindle. That's that's a good one. You know, that's the uh, great, great advice to check this one. And also the previous book that you mentioned. And of course, definitely the uh, podcast of yours, you know, the uh, Productivity Mastery um listeners should uh, check as well so um i mean it's it's great that you covered all of these uh, aspects on what companies can do to improve the values and uh really live them and not just uh, do the management exercise um, and then eventually communicate on the uh, job ads so that uh, the best candidates uh, get attracted to join the company so um yeah the the job of the hr recruiters is, is really hard these days so what would really you hard. say as the last advice uh, before we wrap it up like what would be the last advice on you know how to uh, get more people interested and excited in joining some of these companies once they probably go through these exercises you know they start communicating so what's the one thing you know to use this phrase you know that you would suggest uh, the the recruiters do to attract the top talent it it might sound a little counterintuitive but the one thing i would recommend every recruiter to do is to step up their game in personal time management mm-hmm. I, I mean people are overwhelmed <laughs> and of, often they go to the office and they start doing stuff so my recommendation block 20 minutes in your calendar on a daily basis these are 20 minutes that are not operational. It's strategic thinking. You look mm-hmm. at your day, reflect on your day. You think about what did I achieve? How productive was I? How did I go on the meetings and everything? And then the important part, you prioritize your next day. You you make a list. David Allen, the, the, the guy who wrote the Getting Things Done, another guest on my podcast. This is the Bible of Productivity quote-unquote. Um, he says the problem is your your mind doesn't have one. Right? You, you can't think in your head. You can't prioritize in your head. You need a system. Get a freaking notebook. Get a spreadsheet. Get an app. I don't care. One place where you can dump your brain. Let me have a look at tomorrow. How many interviews do I have to make? How many job ads or whatever I have to do? How many meetings do I have with employees? Okay. And then organize it. The simplest way to do it you capture everything, all the different tasks and meetings and projects. Step number two, you group them. Okay? Um, this is all related to this job path. This is related to the employee experience. This is the re- oh, whatever. Okay. I have six kind of areas I have to focus on tomorrow. Okay. What's the next step? What's the outcome? What is the outcome of this activity? The outcome is not to follow up on leads or Whatever the outcome is to to get three know, candidates to, to, yeah. to get, get three, three candidates. candidates. I don't know. Get three top candidates on, on interviews. Maybe that's your outcome. Okay, mm-hmm. and then and then on this step, you you start brainstorming. What what are the things that I can do to get the outcome? And often it's different than what you initially thought. Okay, mm-hmm. and you start saying no to things. Step number four, you prioritize. Okay. These are the five or six objectives I have for the day. How much time is everything going to take me? Write a copy of a job ad. I don't know, two hours. No idea. Okay, two hours. This is one hour. This is 45 minutes. If I spend one hour with you here on this podcast, I can't spend this anywhere else. I commit it, right? Mm. But I only have limited amount of hours. 
Okay, so so what are the core priorities? And I'm using colors usually. It's like yellow, orange, red. Red is the highest priorities, right? Highest impact. Um, and then I have I have a list of all the things, very organized in terms of the results I want to produce. And the, the most important step is schedule stuff. Okay, writing the copy for the job ad. An hour and a half, two hours, whatever. From nine to 11, I block it in my calendar. I have a meeting with myself to write the copy of the job ad. Hmm. Okay, and you start blocking your calendar. Now, we all know that next day is not going to be completely exactly how we plan because things will happen. But when you do this, when you have a list of your objectives and you, you make the draft of how you plan to spend your day and you commit to it, when something urgent happens, you can move things around really easily, right? Mm -hmm. And you will be feeling free because the, the secret to productivity is to commit to doing one thing at a time, fully commit, you're fully present. And that type of system allows you not to feel stressed about everything else because it's already in your list. Mm. It's You take care of it. It's this kind of a subconscious kind of thing. Like, mm -hmm. I don't worry about my next meeting because I already prioritized time to prepare for it. Mm. So, awesome. focus on your time management, guys. Awesome. That's that's a really great one. I mean, uh, a bit counterintuitive, as you said, you know, at first, but now it totally makes sense because... You know, without prioritizing the work, we may miss the one thing that would really bring more candidates uh, through the doors. So, uh, so that's a great one. Awesome. And uh, you mentioned the uh, ebook or the uh, PDF uh, that people can find on your website. So, what's the URL again, please? Uh, so, so you can go to my webpage, toynyakov.com. Uh, obviously, if you were looking for for some support, external support, I would be really happy to to come and do a workshop, do a session, even discuss working on a program with you guys uh that's what i love to do been traveling in over 35 countries putting programs for teams um my webpage is toynyakov.com you can go to amazon and find our book uh, with a lot of strategies around that it's called perform the unsexy truth about startup success uh, the perform methodology with i think over 50 different cases and examples from different companies that you can get inspired by and uh yeah, just drop me a line. I'm very easy and approachable. Stoyan Yankov, find me on LinkedIn. Drop a line, say hello. Let us know what you thought about the podcast. What was the one thing that stood out for you? <laughs> and if you if you like this podcast, obviously subscribe to the podcast. You know, share this podcast with a friend. Subscribe on Apple. Give give a review to this handsome man here. He deserves <laughs> a, a positive review. And if you enjoyed that one, feel free to check out also Productivity Mastery podcast. Definitely. I'll link uh, the podcast and also your website um, in, in uh, the comment section below so that people can connect with you. And um, yeah, awesome. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for sharing all these insights and tips and uh, um, well, the books and everything. I mean, I just have lots of notes in my paper book. So um, I'll go to, you know, meet our team and do the perform exercise as well. Because uh, it seems to be, just from what you were saying, like really a useful one. So um, thanks for sharing. And uh, guys listening to this, don't forget to plan your day tomorrow. Dedicate 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, thanks, Tian, for being a part of this podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. See you.